OK, so this presentation is on. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, like we captured everybody and then I started the recording and people were like, ah, technology. Bro. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Um, so this is Universal Design Strategies in Teaching and Communication. Um, this is really about creating content that is going to be accessible to people across multiple platforms, um, assistive technology, mobile technology, um, and just making things more available for everyone. So um, what is universal design? I actually kind of love this thing, uh, this uh, Rubik's Cube for Blind Persons by this uh, designer. Um, is this universal design? People are saying yes, some people are saying no. I wouldn't be able to solve this Rubik's Cube if I could solve the Rubik's Cube. I've done it once and can figure out how to do it again. Um, I couldn't do it because all the squares are white and I don't read Braille. I could do it by like peering at the thing and doing symbol matching. Maybe I could do it, but it would be much harder for me. So this is actually accessible design. It's not universal design because it's not making this particular object open to everyone or more open to everyone. It's only, its affordances are specifically for people who read Braille. So it's not even just for all people who, who may be blind. It's just for people who are blind and also read Braille. And also want to solve a Rubik's Cube. Um, so if the squares were colored as well as in Braille, then we would be getting closer to universal design. Okay. So, but this is, this is kind of a great thing because it, it takes one, it's one step Right, but it's not, it's not the full embrace. It's not the full hug. Um, OK, so who does this stuff help? It helps everyone. That's the whole point. We're always trying to look at what's going to make the most impact for the most number of people. So I want to go into this uh, and just start from the beginning about just basic document creation. What's the purpose of a heading in a document? What's it for? To give some idea of what's going to come next. To give some idea of what's going to come next. OK. Well, what's even on that document? What's that? Well, what's even on that document? It's telling you what's in that document. OK. It's a topic. It's a topic. If you have vision, like if you can see, you see the differentiation in the heading, right? And it allows you to quickly scan a document and find the information that you're looking for. You don't actually have to read everything top to bottom. Right? If it's all text, if it's just a block of text, undifferentiated text, if you've ever seen a text file, you know how hard that is to kind of pull out the information. Paragraphs help to add visual structure. Uh, headings help to add visual structure. But these are visual affordances, they are not like sort of internal design document affordances. And in order to get those, you have to do something else. You can't just make the font bigger. You have to do something else. You have to use styles. And particularly in Word, you want to use styles. I don't know how many of you use styles right now in Word. Like you go up to the little styles menu and you poke the buttons and you go heading one, heading two, heading three, bulleted list, those kinds of things. That is what is going to create background structure, semantic structure within the document so that people on other platforms will be able to take advantage of the visual structure that you're actually adding to your documents. You with me? Yes? Other platforms meaning? Meaning email, meaning screen readers. You guys know what a screen reader is? Yes, some people do, some people don't. What's a screen reader? Good thumbnail definition. Anyway, yeah. It converts text to, to speech. Audio. Yep. It reads the text aloud to you. So styles create easy, consistent visual structure, but they also create underlying semantic structure for other devices. And this looks like if you do HTML, you know what this looks like, probably. H1 tags, H2 tags, P tags. OL, UL, ordered lists, unordered lists, those kinds of things. So if you look at this, what's the difference here? What's the difference between these two? Can you tell? 
I mean, there's obviously some visual difference, but really, what's the difference? It's more uh, organized. It's the contact info is at the bottom. Mm -hmm. This actually has an announcement. Basically, this heading functions as a, an announcement of what's coming right after it. Right? I don't have that over here. Visually, I can still get all that information actually pretty quickly if, if I can see. If I can't, I have to start at the top and read. I have everything read to me, left to right, top to bottom, if I don't have headings in place. This is just pure, I made the font bigger, I made it bold, I did this kind of stuff. And this will help someone who can see. This does not. This, this helps people who can't see. And this actually gives you a better organizational structure visually, too. This actually calls it out. And so the screen reader will announce that. And it will tell someone who can't see, here's the contact information. You know, my daughter's dyslexic. Mm -hmm. I now understand what she's saying. I never saw that until this morning. Good. Oh. Cool. Yeah. Come on in. So styles apply to all kinds of documents. You can use styles in Word. You can use them in PowerPoint. I'm using them in this PowerPoint. You can use them in HTML. And you probably should. It will make your life easier. Uh, using them in Word will make your life easier, too. Um, if you decide, hey, you know what? I need to make a global change to this document. You can just go in and edit the style right? and make all of your paragraph font uh, two points bigger or something. Um, styles apply to PDFs. They're much dif more difficult to work with. Um, but they do apply. Google Apps has styles. All these things have styles that are going on in the background. It makes your life easier. And when I used to be in corporate communications work um, and using Word and Outlook all the time, I hated the built-in styles, the native styles that were in Word. But it's really easy to change them, and I just didn't know that. So I would just go in and like change the bulleted list style manually. I'm like, I'm gonna, or I'd put the bullets in, like I'd actually make a shortcut for the bullet character, and it was control, alt, shift, something, because um, I knew how to do that, uh, weirdly, um, and just make my own bulleted style. Um, but it wouldn't, wasn't helpful to anybody but people who could see. Um, and it made my life a lot harder because I had to go in and manually edit everything. It was a real drag. So actually using the built-in styles functions in these, in these applications can be very helpful for you and for everybody else. There it is. That's the styles menu. Normal, section header, heading one, heading two, title, all that stuff has meaning in the background. You never see it, but other people will. Other people can make use of it. If you're copying it into a web page, makes use of it. It's kind of a bad transfer from Word to web, but it's better than nothing. Um, and if HTML scares you, it's a good choice. Um, this is Canvas. So that's an example of a heading in Canvas. That's where you get it, in the upper right-hand corner. This paragraph menu, not the font size menu, paragraph menu, and you pick Heading 2. And that'll give you heading two. Oh, is calendar heading three? What? Is the calendar entry heading three? It is heading three. Yep. Unfortunately, Canvas only gives you three levels of headings. Um, but, you know, you do what you can. Um, I always am like bumping up against that going, I need a fourth order heading and I can't get it. Um, you can hard code it into the HTML. Um, it looks like this. I don't know if you guys can see that. But let's see. Where's my pointer? This H2 tag right here. These are paired tags. That means it's a heading level two. right? And here's a heading level three. You were asking that, um, Jan. That's right there. Um, and then it's, it's also padded so that it's indented, which you can do right in Canvas. But using the bulleted list functions in Word as well as the styles, I can show you. Let's see. Escape. 
Let me get word here. Yeah, the indentation, you can, like, I hear, I'm hearing you, Jen, like, you can you do indentation, you don't have to. Um, so, like, this is an example of a tagged document. Like, the style, styles are in effect. And um, this is an old syllabus for me. Um, but if I click on this, you can't actually see because this window is so small. Um, but I can get this drop down to open up, and you can see this is a heading one. And we'll get down to this guy. And we can see that's a heading three. Why is that heading three? Oh, because those are heading twos, right? So they look very similar, but they actually have a little bit different meaning. Because I want that's that you order headings in level of importance, right, for the document. Um, this is no, that should be a heading four. I've got those messed up. It's been a while since I looked at that. That's a heading three, right? That's a heading three. These are all of the same importance. What's your bullet? They're a bulleted list paragraph. It's not actually showing in here for some reason. It's not showing as the list paragraph, but it is. Um, you can actually see it light up here. So these are list paragraphs. That's an unordered list. This is an ordered list. They have different meanings in HTML. I feel like I may be getting too much into the weeds on this, um, but it's actually really simple to use these built-in settings in Word. You just go, oh, you know what? That's a first order heading. That's like the, my most important thing. That's my second most important thing. That has equal importance. These are kind of equal of equal importance. And this is not just about uh, the tools. This is also about technical writing um, procedures, documentation procedures. Uh, so this table is kind of um, interesting. I used to do this differently. Um, Tables are read top to bottom and left to right by a screen reader. So it'll start in the, I'm walking away, I should be pointing here because I'm recording. Um, it starts here and it'll say column one, row one, ah. It doesn't say A, it says ah, um, because it just does. Uh, this frequently the screen readers don't quite get it. They're okay, but they're not perfect. Um, and then it'll say column one, row or column two, row one, B, column two, or column three, row one, C, column four, row one, D, column four, and it'll announce that. It may not, if you have the heading set up right, it may not do that all the time, um, particularly when you get further down. It'll say A, A plus not used, B plus 87 to 89, C plus 70, because I have the column heading set up correctly. These are head up, set up as headers. So we'll actually announce that that's it. If it if you don't have headers set up, it'll just go through and it'll be like it would it would say for example the mid range C it would say column three row three seventy four to seventy six column four row three sixty to sixty six tables are very complex for screen readers so applying headings is super duper important. And we'll talk a little bit uh, in a second about not using columns for layout if you're doing HTML or content pages in Canvas and that kind of thing. You do not use tables to force things to line up because it confuses screen readers. Like just, it's okay. Uh, there are ways to get around it, but, so this is Word. Um, Canvas looks like this. Let me get into this guy. get into discussions. Where are my discussions? Because I just want to use the same thing. Um, it was this one, right? This was the one I had showed you the screenshot of. If you actually get in and edit this, you'll see the HTML editor showing you this. But if you go into the HTML, come on, Rich Content Editor. Thank you, Canvas. Broken. There we go. <laughs> Broken. No, uh, so like if I just click in here, you can see it's a heading two. If I click in here, that should not be a heading two. Why is it saying heading two? That's a lie. 
Also, see, it's saying heading three over on the side. <laughs> um, this is because the screen is too small right now. It's not liking it. It's not displaying correctly. OK, but there it is. Um, this actually has alt text, and you can find that by going, clicking on this and just clicking on this little guy. Uh, please. Come on, Canvas. There you go. Right? You can actually see here's the alt text. That's where you put it in, even if you don't want to do HTML. Wow. Network is slow. There we go. And that's why I'm using Camtasia to record this. All right. So those are just some examples of where styles live in those kinds of documents. All right. Are we cool? I feel like I'm making people glaze over, um, and I don't mean to do that. Uh, additional resources are here on this slide. Like I said, I will share this slide, and I will let people know where these resources are and the recording as well. Um, you can't actually see that because I'm not in the slideshow. I apologize. There. There are additional resources. Uh, WebAIM is kind of awesome. Um, if you don't know WebAIM uh, and you want to know more about making things more accessible for people on the web, that is the place to go. Um, here's a section 508 site from the government. Because if you receive money from the federal government, it is required that your documents be accessible. The federal government has a requirement that you comply with section 508. Um, and that's where they talk about it. Um, okay. So this is one of my favorite things, is color and contrast. Um, because it's something that people use. Like, we have all these tools now, right? We have all these ways to make things awesome and really pretty, right? And we go, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make that red, and I'm going to make this green, and it's going to be beautiful, and like I'm going to do all this stuff. And we forget that there are people who can't see color or only see certain ranges of color. Um, this is actually one of those places, uh, one of the few places where men get the short end of the stick. 8% uh, of the US population, I think global population actually, but US population definitely, 8% of men in the US have some form of red or green color insensitivity. Uh, there is a blue color insensitivity as well. Um, it is very rare. It occurs equally in men and women, and it's about half a percent of the global population. This is why when you link to things online, links are blue. This is also why they're underlined for the half a percent of the world population that can't see blue. You get underlines. That's what those are for. This is an example of, this is an accessibility color wheel, um, and it's kind of awesome. You probably can't really see this very well, um, but the top bar up there is black text on a red background, right here. This is what it looks like to someone who has a green insensitivity. This is what it looks like to someone who has a red insensitivity. And this is what it looks like to someone who has a blue insensitivity. So if you can't see blue, this is totally fine, as good as it is for anybody else, right? for the most part. But if you can't see red, these contrast ratios, these saturation levels, pure red, true red, black text, it's over. You're not going to see anything. I actually had an argument with an instructor at one point who was highlighting all of her links and all of the important things in her documents on Canvas in red and not changing the text color to white. And I was like, you can't do this. And she was like, well, why not? And I was like, because people can't read it. Like, it's just like you're, you're doing it. And her redesign, actually, she was intending to reach people who weren't normally reached by, uh, who weren't reached as well uh, in the social sciences in online classes. Well, we have some good data that shows that men actually do less well in social science classes online than women do. Um, and, and I was like, you're actually shutting out the people you're trying to redesign for. And she's like, but nothing pops like red. And I was like, yeah, if you can see it, right? Like, <laughs> if you can't, it just looks like a block of black text, like a block, block of black. You can't see it at all, right? So it's going to really shut some people out. Um, What's the URL? 
Um, it is, uh, do I have it right here? Um, it's the second one. That one is the second one. I actually prefer contrast A. Contrast A is, is a, a nicer setup. It's a little harder to use, but it's you get a, a prettier interface and, and more information on contrast ratios and does it meet, like what level of web compliance does it meet? Um, because for larger text, you can get away with more. Not, not with the red and black stuff and the green and black, you can't get away with that at all. Um, but uh, with larger text, your contrast, background, and foreground colors don't have to be as high contrast because the text is larger. Um, so what's your rule of thumb in? Is there a color contrast that works for most people? Yep. The best is blue with yellow text, which just sounds terrible, right? Like it's, uh, it just sounds fugly, right? It just does not sound good. Um, dark uh, online, a dark background with a light colored text like this, uh, black with white text is actually best because you get better contrast ratios and also, um, yeah, no, don't go away. Where are you? Come back. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other thing that happens is um, on a page, if you have white and if you have black and white text, you're putting ink on a page. The ink is actually going to potentially spread a little bit. So your your letters could get larger. They shouldn't get smaller as long as your ink saturation is right and your printing press. Right? Online, if you have white text, if you have a white background and black text, the white light actually encroaches on the black text and makes it smaller. If you have a black background and white text, the letters can spread. They can they they will overwhelm the background. So it actually you can get away with smaller text when you have a dark background and light text. Um, you can get away with um, yeah you can get away with smaller smaller text. It's just it's a better contrast um, to do dark background. We're just not used to it, and for some reason our default is a white background. So you're suggesting PowerPoint presentations that should have either a black background or a blue background? A dark background, yes. And, it, and light text, light foreground, absolutely. As opposed yep. to white. Yep. Black and white, uh, like white background, black text is going to be fine, but it's, it's better to have a dark background and light text. For most people. All of these things that I'm saying are true for most people. Yeah, and there's WebAIM's contrast checker there as well. Like I said, WebAIM is awesome. Ah, um, so that's color. Mobile access and why it's an important barometer for our for our students particularly. This is a big deal, right? This is an example of an email that I got. I have my email from Seattle Community Colleges, Seattle Colleges, uh, going to my phone, right? My phone, by default, does not download images. <clears throat> this is an example of an image-only email with absolutely no additional attachments or anything about what is going on. I, I whited out what the rest of it said because you would know who it was. But, but um, this is a screenshot of my phone. See the little blue s square in the middle of the question mark? I got nothing. Right. So this is what it looks like to someone who has no vision if they get your email. They got nothing. Your, your poster that you had made up for your event that you stuck in your email, um, and that's all you put in. But it's not just people who can't see. It's also people who are using mobile devices to access their email. So then we go from an issue of equity, we also add then something that seems much less important, uh, bad marketing, right? Then it becomes bad marketing too, right? So am I gonna download this me this message? Absolutely not, I don't have time. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but like, I don't have time for that. Like, give it to me in plain text. That will help me. Or give me a plain text equivalent in the same body, in the body of the same email. Right? Just give me that exact same information, just type it in. 
Hey, wanted to let you know we're having this event at this day on this time in this place. Y'all come. As opposed to an image. As opposed to an image. Or in addition to the image. Right? And this is an important barometer for our students because more and more of our students are using their mobile devices as their primary or exclusive means of accessing the internet. Pew research shows that more and more, this is the case, the younger the population, the, the sort of segments of the population that are younger, this is true. Also students of color, people of color, generally are using their, their mobile devices for, as their exclusive means of accessing the internet. And if that is true for our students, and we are building our classes with information encoded into images, it makes it much harder. Because while their phones may download those images, it will take more time, it costs more bandwidth, like they have to have a larger data plan, right? There's all this stuff. Images are important, right? They help us to retain things if we can see them. However, encoding all of your information in an image only, this becomes a problem. So always giving people alternatives. And this will set you up, if you're a teacher, um, this will set you up uh, if you do have a student who needs an accommodation. Uh, you won't be uh, instantly buried on the first day of the quarter, going, ah, you know, like, I have to translate all of this into plain text or whatever. Um, PowerPoints are accessible, right? You can highlight the text. Like, not here because I'm in the slideshow. But, um, you can actually highlight the text and people can still read it. They can use accessible devices to accessibility affordances to read it. Um, Are there smart, is there software that will be screen read on, on smartphones? It's built into the operating system for Android and iOS. It is awesome. Um, and the next, um, what's that? Windows font. I, I do not know. I don't have a Windows uh, mobile device to play with. Um, but I can tell you that the next flavor of Android is going to have um, uh, six um, color insensitivity uh, default settings. So you can go in and go, I don't see this range of colors. And it will just change everything for you. It's awesome. Um, so like, we live in the future, right? Like, it's cool. Um, there's all this stuff that we can do that's baked into the, into the uh, technology that we use. We just have to know that it's there. Um, you can get your phone to read a book to you, right? Like, that's, it, it, you can get, of course, audiobooks, right? But there's, there was this whole lawsuit about like having a reader built into to, to smartphones and that like audiobook people were going, no, it's infringing on our copyright and all this stuff. Um, but it's, it's there. It's actually still there in the background. You can just sort, sort of go, turn on the screen reader and then the book will just, it'll just read the book to you if you want. Um, it's kind of cool. It makes it harder to use your phone in other ways if you're used to navigating by vision. Um, so, but mobile access is an important barometer, particularly for our students and our student population. Um, look what you can do in just regular old email, right? Like you can create headings, you can insert an image, you can have the text wrap. You don't have to make these really involved posters to announce things for uh, on you know email. You can just take a particular image that you had built for your poster, maybe. Um, a little emblem, a little icon, iconize it, you know? And just leverage that content into the email as like a visual branding for that particular event, right? And not just have everything sort of trapped in an image. So, um, so this is an example. I actually wanna show you guys something. One of the things you can do, like you can always add an additional accessibility affordance, right? You have your thing in your image, right? Give people another way to get it. Either do plain text or something else. I, I want to show you guys something that, and I'm not trying to call anybody out, but it came through an email yesterday, and I always check. Like, if I get an image-only email, I'm like, is there another way for me to get this information? Just because I like to, I, I just keep track of that stuff. I just want to know. Um, I don't think it's as huge of an issue here because of our student population. I don't know, and you would, but I don't know how many students we have that are blind here. Do we have any? Um, or have like extremely low vision? A few. Okay. It's not, in general, nationally it's not a huge population. But, but here on this campus, do we have many or any or? Some. 
We do have some. Okay, so then it is an issue. Um, uh, when I was at Bellevue, our Disability Resource Center director uh, is blind and has a, she has a service dog. And um, uh, so she was on that kind of stuff. She would go, I have no idea what you're saying. Like she'd send it, like someone would send out a global email and she'd send it back and go, what's this for? Right? To out, back out to everybody. Like, I can't tell. Um, so she was kind of awesome for that uh, and it made me more sensitive to what was going on. Um, but so like I said, I'm not trying to call anybody out about this, but this was really interesting to me. Um, this email came through about this study session. There it is. Um, and it was beautiful. I don't have it open. Momento. Come on, you. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, let me get this in here. It's pretty, right? It's beautiful. Right? So what they had done was they put this in as an image in the email, and then they attached this PDF. PDFs have text in them. So it gives us an equivalent. Now, I don't know if the intention was to say, here's this thing, now you have a poster version of it, post it wherever, or if it was an intention to give someone else an additional way to access this information. Um, but what happens when we look at this is um, there are tools in, in Acrobat where you can actually say, you know what, I want to run an accessibility track and all this stuff. But this is the thing that I'm always most interested in is the reading order because this dictates how a screen reader will be able to enter into this document. If you make a well-tagged document in Word and convert it to a PDF, you're basically set, right? It works really well. Unless you use a Mac and it doesn't make accessible PDFs. Word does not make accessible PDFs from Mac. Yeah. Um, Pages does. Word does not. Um, thank you, computer. Why do you keep shutting off? OK. Like it's going to answer me. Um, uh, no, not setup assistant. Why did I do that? Cancel. I want touch up reading order. This is the reading order. This is how much stuff there is. And we can actually look at it and say, OK, well, what's going on here? I need to see, um, is it that the one the reading order? Yeah, that's the reading order. So number six is my first piece of text. Number 15 is my next piece of text. I have some text here on number 33. But I would, if I were using a screen reader, I would have to plow through all of this to get to here. Right? And then there are images that are not tagged. Here's this last thing. Here's a link. Right? We've got 101 things. Um, and what was really interesting to me is that there is actually a, um, there's a piece of text in here that is uh, not actually text. It's this one. That, the name of the instructor, is not, um, it's an image. It's not actually readable. Yeah. Oh. Her, so we don't all no, 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 you, no. Nobody should email, and I'm not trying to call anybody out. Like, no, know, it is know. beautiful, right? But and what's... No, I, don't, I don't think you should... Uh, it's, not, it's not her fault. No, it's nobody's fault, and I right? I really appreciate that because I worked with, um, you know, the staff. She's new, and this is how I've been doing it, too. Mm -hmm. And that's why... That's how we're all doing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's why I really right. appreciate you because, you know, we meet every week, and parts of it, we're not thinking about accessibility for mm -hmm. students. Yeah. Know? Right. You know, we're supposed to be accessible, and um, and that that we have to you know take in with what you're saying. Like I didn't know, I wasn't aware about these tools. Right. I, I People don't know about them. them. Right. That's what. That's why. That's why I'm doing this. Because yeah, like yeah, this is exactly yeah, why. Yeah, but this helps me. Like you know, part of our steps is not just to make it look you know attractive, mm -hmm. the basic information, but make it accessible. So yep. This tells me that you know for our Anapizi team, like we need to go check through this so that our students can access you know, this information. 
mm -hmm. and read it and see it. Yep. Yeah, and because there are actually little things in there that are um, there are additional stars that are kind of layered on, and yeah. it is like with with uh, if we take the tags away, it really is pretty, right? It's beautiful, right? The additional the really easy solution to this is to put your poster in as an image, as a JPEG, like it came out in the original email, but don't attach the PDF, just at the bottom, in text yeah. say, this is what's happening, this is where it's happening, this is when, and this is what it's about, and this is who we are. And, that, and you just have a little text block at the bottom, and you get the exact same result as attaching this, which additionally is also um, uh, 400, I think, K, um, something like that, which is a, a large file when we only have a 400 megabyte storage space in our inbox, right? So that's the other thing. Like, we can, the JPEG takes very little space, right? And so additional text takes almost no space, right? Attaching a PDF depends on what your intention is. If you're like, please print this out and post it, then that's one thing. You could add a link to it and say, hey, get this off of Google Docs or whatever, um, and make that public. There are lots of different ways to address that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just for clarification, um, <clears throat> this was created as an image converted to a PDF and then sent Was it? Well, I don't know. Okay. My guess is that, and you both. you know, yeah. so like it was... The, the email box is an image and then the attachment is a PDF. Oh, I see. So, so this the intention of the PDF is that you want to print it out yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Or forward it to yeah. other... My guess is that it was probably created in something like InDesign or yeah. Publisher, Publisher. And, and then exported to a PDF and then exported to a JPEG. Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when the tags are made, is that kind of step-by-step step what the creator was yep. doing? Oh, yeah. Okay. It, it is. Um, the, so it does follow that step. path. Mm -hmm. When you do an export from Word or from other things, yeah, it does. Act, from Word, it doesn't do that. Okay. It actually does it in the order that you kind of would read, read it. Um, so that it actually works pretty well. For this, because there is no, um, because the software is not really designed as a linear reading software, the design software is not designed to read linearly, like that's not what it's for, um, then it just kind of goes based on when you put it in and the last thing that you had your hands on, kind of. Um, okay. Yeah. That's, um, so are you able to provide those steps Providing steps. Yes, I can. Um, yep. Yep. Those some some of the links that are in this presentation will take you to resources like that. Um, WebAIM is good for that. Um, there's actually um, in the section at the end of this on PDFs, which I'll get to here in just a second. Hopefully, maybe. Um, it's just a lot of the things tend to intersect. So um, it has uh, resources for how to um, make accessible PDFs. The folks at um, UW uh, do IT. Uh, they are kind of awesome. Um, and they are about accessibility. Uh, and Terrell Thompson has some great walkthroughs about how to do these kinds of things. So let me just see. Let's go here. Uh, tables, I, t I mentioned briefly, keep tables simple. Don't use them for, for web layout. Uh, at least not for complex web layout. Tables are for tabular data. That's what they're for. Um, use headers for columns and rows if they are uh, if appropriate. Um, and use technology to help you, right? This is a tool builder. This is a, a table builder, which is kind of great. The table builder in Canvas is terrible. Avoid it at all costs. I'm not kidding. Um, that's not a joke. Like, it's, you, once you make a table in Canvas, you cannot add additional cells and rows to it. You, oh. it just, it, you can't do stuff with it unless you get in and start coding the HTML. Never use the table creator in Canvas if you can avoid it. I always use Dreamweaver or something else. This uh, composer with a K, by the way, and a Z, uh, K-O-M-P-O-Z-E-R, is a freeware um, HTML creator that you can use to create tables. Um, anything else, and then copy and paste that uh, HTML into Canvas. Um, oh, using alt text on images. Um, in Word, when you're creating alt text, always use the description box. Do not use the title box. The description box will come over 
uh, into multiple applications. The title box is just something that Word has put in for you for some reason. Um, uh, okay, that's why. But it's not in the tool Yeah. So describe the image. Don't just give it a title when you're making alt text. So alt text is basically a, visual, is a, a text description of what the image is. What's that? Gross. Hey, this is a slime mold. Slime molds are kind of awesome um, as life forms. Uh, they're, why? You horrible thing, you. Um, okay, sorry. Um, it just keeps punking out. Um, do not put gross in the alt text. Do not put things that provide additional information other than uh, in addition to what you could gather from looking at it. Don't, in the alt text, don't say, uh, photo taken by so-and-so on this day at this time, and don't and not put it elsewhere in the text of the page, because now you're doing the opposite of, make, you're like making it in, that information inaccessible to people who see. So you don't want to do that. Yeah. Alt text, alternate text. It is an alternate text description of an image. It's available in Word. You can right click on it and format the image and it comes up. Um, it happens online all the time. Um, I don't know if you saw the canvas thing when I clicked on the little picture button and went, here's the alt text. Yeah. So photo of a slime mold on the forest floor would be appropriate alt text here because that's what it is, right? It may also be gross, but that requires an interpretive move on your part. So um, try to avoid creating images out of text. Let me show you one. Can you turn off this so that it doesn't go look like you have? You know that you're shortening the time that it's looking for meaningful text. I don't know what you mean. Yep, you can clear everything out. Yep, and you can just say only read the text. Um, if everything else is decoration, that's appropriate. Yeah. Um, let me show you guys this. This is an image. It is. It looks like text, right? It is text, but it's an image. Know how I can tell? See how it moves? Oh, yeah. That's how you can tell it's an image. It's telling me what it's linking to. But if I go in, I can actually show you the alt text on that image. I click on that. I poke the little tree button. Introduction to Canvas is what it says, because that's what it says. right? It's text. And I don't use that very often. I just wanted that style of font right there this particular font because it echoes some other fonts that are, get used in the system and that's just what I wanted. So I generally speaking don't use that strategy, but you can. But yeah. So if you're on Publisher and mm -hmm. there's like a, you know, you create a text box, mm -hmm. you're able to move around the text box, so is yep. that considered an image? Nope, that's text. Still text. Okay. Like you can tell if it's text or not if you highlight it and you can highlight it letter by letter by letter. Okay. If you look at this, I can't do that. It's one thing. And if I go like this, it's an image, right? It's there. Like here, I can go, you can see it's like actual text. That's how you can tell if a PDF that has text in it as well is actually tagged or not. Uh, or not tagged, but actually is text or not. Yeah? Is that like word art? It is actually, um, no, it's, I created the Im I created the text in Fireworks and then saved it as a JPEG. Okay. Does WordArt do the same thing then? Does it make it? Like uh, an image? E e no. No. Um, you would have to test the conversion, but generally speaking, in the Word document, Word documents, by the way, are way more accessible than PDFs. Okay. So if you want to share stuff, like what's the value of a PDF? You got to ask yourself, why am I doing it as a PDF instead of 
as a Word document. But if you're doing Word art, it retains its editability as as uh, text. Um, so let me I just show that. So what is the value of a PDF? Like, why do you want to use a PDF as opposed to a Word document? Yeah, some people think it's because, like, oh, people won't be able to edit my stuff. Not true. Um, like, if you have Acrobat Pro, easy. Um, convert to a Word document. Convert the PDF to a Word document. You can edit it and change it. Why do you care if somebody edits it? I don't get it. Um, but some people are uptight about that. Okay. Um, but uh, PDFs are not more accessible than Word documents. Word documents are far more accessible. Um, they're just easier for people to read. They're easier for people to access on multiple platforms. Um, the, well, Word, you have to have Word to read the document. So there's that hurdle. So if you're over that hurdle, then it's more accessible. PDFs, you can get a free PDF reader. Hell, you can get a free Word reader as well, come to think of it. So um, you can put Word documents into Google Docs and it converts them. It will actually display them on the screen for you. Like, there's all kinds of ways around this now. You don't have to have Word to open a Word doc. Um, a PDF just locks in your styles. It just locks in the look and feel of your document. That's the benefit of it. If you really want it to look the way that you've designed it, and you can't rely on other people having the fonts that you used, OK, do a PDF. Um, this is just an example of an image. Uh, th this is just an image of what a tagged uh, PDF looks like, like the options in the PDF, um, the save window from Word. Um, there are three general types of PDF. They are either image, text document with no underlying structure, or a tagged, well-structured document. Let me show you um, really quickly here. I know I'm getting kind of pressed up uh, for time. Um, not this one. Where are you, pointer? Go away. All right. So this, what's the difference between this and this? Oh, it's showing the read order. Um, let's not. Uh, I don't want you to show the reading order. It doesn't matter. We'll live. Okay. Um, aside from the reading order showing, what's the difference between this and this? No, no that, that's, on, that's only framed because of the reading order, and I, I'm not quite sure how to turn it off right now. Um, what's the difference? This isn't text. I did a print to PDF. Yeah, it kind of squished uh, in places, um, so you'll get that sometimes. Um, yeah, you can make anything inaccessible. <laughs> it's really not that hard. Actually, this was very tough to do. Like, everything that I opened up, it kept wanting to make it into something else. And so I actually had to take a screenshot of the document and save it as a pen, like, can export it to PDF and say, no, don't do optical character recognition. Right? It's actually very hard to do this now. It used to be very easy to make inaccessible PDFs. So. Um, I know we're at five minutes, so I'm going to kind of stop and uh, let people go if they need to go. Thank you, you for this coming. Is it is going to be available. I am going to put it up online. Uh, I am not sure where yet, um, but I will make sure that the, the word gets out. Okay. What's that? Yes, we will do that. I'm going to put it in the advanced Canvas training shell. Um, but does anybody have questions? Like, I know I like kind of blitz through a lot of things, and there's I, I feel like there may not be as much structure here as, as there needs to be to really understand this. The things to take away, use headings, use styles, consider other people's point, points of view and how other people are going to be accessing your information. 
Don't assume that everyone can see. Don't assume that everyone sees the same way you do. Um, when we get into video, don't assume that everybody can hear, like that kind of stuff. Um, can you touch upon video? There is video in here a bit. Um, but I actually wanted to tell you guys one other thing before everybody goes. There's, I'm just blitzing through the captioning stuff. Ah, um, this is bonus slide of 33, um, because I just found out about this yesterday. Um, there is a web accessibility MOOC for online educators, WAMO, uh, from, uh, it is uh, Portland Community College and Desire to Learn in partnership. They are running this MOOC. Um, it starts October 20th, so that's Monday. It's free, because MOOCs are free. And they're kind of, they're not always free, but th this one is. It's a five week long course. Those are the course outcomes. How to create accessible photo images, diagrams, and charts, accessible audio and video, accessible HTML, accessible course content, and other formats. So that's all the things that I kind of blitzed through. I'm happy to do other sessions about this kind of stuff. Um, there's also Quality Matters, which the state pays for us to do. Uh, um, they have a new uh, workshop on the Quality Matters Standard 8, which is accessibility, and the state is willing to pay for us to take that. So that's another thing. Um, uh, yeah, quality. quality matters. And you, to register for Quality Matters workshops, you have to come through us uh, at the TLC. You cannot do it on your own. If you register on your own, the state will make you pay for it. They will not pay for it for you. Like We have a, a separate process that we have to run through in order to do it. And it's uh, kind of kludgy and weird, but in order for the billing, billing to work correctly, we have to do it. Um, so yeah. Uh, I have a question. It's five weeks. It is so. It's at your own pay. It's an online class. It's a MOOC, but you've got five weeks to do it. Um, I, I don't know how it's structured in terms of can you work ahead or do you have to stay with every week or what. Um, check it out. But I will make sure this stuff is is posted uh, somewhere that is available for everyone. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. I'm sorry, like it was bliss, but um, it's really a consciousness raising thing more than anything else. Oh no, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>